can you talk about commitment issues? You are completely limiting your possibilities. What would you say are some of the biggest red flags at the beginning of dating someone? Mm. Attraction wanes. You've got to know where you're going. You've got to find that depth. What do you think dating apps have done to the kind of world of dating? The minute that something doesn't feel right, your instinct is usually correct. Is the love language stuff bullshit? My number one pet hate and common mistake is... Thanks so much for joining me. I am so happy to be here. Truly. You are, you are, you know, you're quite a big deal. Oh, thank you. You're quite a big deal, babes. Uh, you know, I <laughs> don't need it. You, I mean, honestly, having a little Instagram stalk of you, as we all do, um, I was just like, damn, I just, just, we just got it all going on. Stop. I feel like right so old fine. fart. Honestly. No, well, you have. Seriously, you're strong, you're confident. You don't struggle in life, Grace. Oh, thank you. I can tell. Oh, not so sure. Not sure my friends would agree, but we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> that can be like the public perception. Yeah. We're going to go into a full dating and relationships, not necessarily how to, big old discussion, mm. your expertise. But before we go into that, how did you get to where you are now? Mm. And what is your kind of expertise? I mean, great question. And I think probably the answer I'm still trying to work <laughs> no on. No idea. No idea. I mean, honestly, Grace, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, I've just turned 41. And I think to myself, I've been schlepping around this weird old industry of I don't know, what is this industry? Showbiz, uh, entertainment, broadcasting, whatever it is, for like over 20 years. I got into this when I was 17. I, I'm friends with Kate Garraway and we often say the same thing. We're like farts. We just, we just linger. We waft around and we still come back. Um, but my career has taken many sort of twists and turns over the years, over the last decade. God, I'm, I'm, having a, I'm having an age crisis today. Are you? Yeah, what is this? It's, it's always just those general days that you're just like, oh, yeah. you really realise things. I'm yeah. sounding like Kylie Jenner I mean, in that <laughs> clip about realising things. But you do. Sometimes I'm just like, God, okay. I think it's my kids today. My kids mm. were a handful today. And I thought, I'm too old for this. Too old for this. Um, no, but my, my career has taken quite a few sort of twists and turns, really, and, and uh, to where I end up now. And I, I love that. I am someone that thrives off unpredictability, mm -hmm. which is weird considering I am a very public anxiety sufferer. You know, I, I have GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, and often control comes with that. But I, I love control. I need control and routine in my life, but I also thrive on unpredictability. And I also am quite a risk taker in when something happens to me or I see an avenue, I do tend to weigh up the risk, but mm -hmm. I do tend to just go for it and go, hey, sod it, let's see where it takes me. Um, so I started out in kids' telly. Actually, I spent uh, 10 years uh, jumping around various channels uh, on kids' telly. Um, I think that's why it makes me feel old, because sometimes I'm like, get people go, I see you on Slebs Go Dating, or I see you, you know, we're doing your Luana stuff. Or, you know, where do I know you from? Oh, that's it. I used to watch you on Toonatic, the ITV Kids Show, and I was like six, and I'm like, brilliant. And now you're someone Fantastic. that's, that's basically so employing me. <laughs> uh, but thanks for loving that back in the day. Um, but really, I mean, it's, a, it's quite a long <laughs> journey. Uh, I'll try and keep it concise. But I, so I started out really in telly, in, in more entertainment, more journalistic side of things, in sort of showbiz and, and where... Uh, my life in performing arts really is kind of where my my career started. Uh, it was all really a happy accident, and I always just sort of took an opportunity and then and then rolled with it. And then really, what I would characterise as my biggest challenge at the time, I would have said my biggest downfall, really has turned into my my ultimate strength, really positivity. In that, when I was in my mid twenties, I had a spectacular breakdown, emotional breakdown. Um, it's what one might characterize as a mental breakdown, you know, mm -hmm. if you were back in the 1980s. Um, and that was as a result of being in a toxic relationship. It was coercively controlling. I didn't know that at the time. Didn't even understand it. No, yeah. I talked about that yeah. 15, 16 years ago. The most I'd heard about that was, you know, little Mo on for his way, I remember this, little Mo on his stenders, you know, a big storyline and a soap, you know, to do with domestic abuse. You know, it just wasn't a thing. No yeah. one really understood what, what, what that was all about. And I was in my uh, mid-twenties, I was on the telly, in kids, kids' telly, and I had this uh, relationship which was, was really unhealthy um, and sort of played into all of my um, 
things I really needed to work on, as in I was a classic people pleaser. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd always say, yes, I'm very open. I'm very vulnerable. I'm very, uh, vulnerability is our strength and we should all embrace that. But my vulnerability was really taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. I was taken advantage of. Anyway, this relationship was bad news. As a result of that, I ended up uh, suffering with panic attacks and um, a huge cocktail of mental health uh, uh, issues as a result of having um, severe anxiety. I then had a, a breakdown because I wasn't getting the help and seeking mm -hmm. the help. Anyway, got out of that relationship, got help, that's wonderful, um, had therapy. Hurrah, what is therapy? Didn't know what therapy was. <laughs> Isn't that a bit embarrassing? Isn't that a bit like, pfft, no one sees. The only people that see therapy is like my great auntie so-and-so, do you know what I mean? Back in the 1960s, you got sectioned, mm. you know. It, it had really negative connotations. And yet for me, it was just, it was like, it was, it was like the sunglasses came off. Mm. I was like, oh my God, this is who I am. This is who I don't want to be. This is what I don't want in my life. This is what I do want in my life. Love therapy. Um, and essentially, working in telly, working, uh, you know, I've gone on working podcasting, radio and everything else, but I wanted something that was just for me, that where I, again, the control word, where I wasn't um, at the beck and call of producers giving me a job mm -hmm. or not. And I was interested in therapy and, and, and self-care and working on myself. So I started studying and training, you know, it was my mm -hmm. thing behind the scenes. And then that naturally, as it often does in the world of, of therapy, you you end up being drawn to a modality that suits you, you mm -hmm. know, and your natural passions and interests, which were relationships. You know, I'd been in a toxic relationship. I'd suffered with mental health uh, problems. So I started to really naturally be drawn to uh, talking therapies um, around relationships, um, around dating, around who we are, um, being the best we can be to ourselves, actually not needing a relationship, wanting mm -hmm. a relationship, yeah. all these subtle changes. And that's really how it ended up happening, a natural passion. And I just got, I'm interested in people. And then it it all kind of fast forward really ended up with me um, four years ago, been asked to join Celebs Go Dating uh, on E4, which is obviously a dating show as a dating mm -hmm. coach. Uh, and then that's gone leaps and bounds. We've very much changed that show um, as, as we've gone through it to really encourage coaching. And then I've recently just launched my brand new coaching hub, The Relationship Place, which is essentially I want to just... Honest relationshiping is how mm. I sort of title it. I just want to put tangible, practical, easy to understand help and advice out there for anyone that's struggling with themselves and in a relationship. Because let's be honest, Grace, we all argue, mm. we all bicker, we all fantasize about breaking up and divorcing sometimes. <laughs> if you've got kids like I have, you really regret those decisions sometimes. It's normal. And that's what I want people to know. The relationship place is about coming to somewhere where you go, I just need a little bit of help yeah. without feeling like I have to go right down that road of therapy. And I feel like there's a lot online at the moment. There's a lot of vulnerability about almost everything. Mm. But I feel like because a relationship usually involves two people or more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I have concerns over that, but it can. It, it, can, it can involve two people or more. Um, there's, I would say there's a lack of transparency around relationships because mm. it's very much seen as, we can talk about makeup, we can talk about careers, we can talk about mm. what we, where our mental health, all of these things. Mm. But I genuinely think there's a lack of transparency around relationships and rightly so, because people don't necessarily want to, you know, air their dirty it's, laundry. It's highly private. Yeah. But I do think that it probably, you know, the only real things you see online about relationships are either this kind of idea of couple goals and like all of them break up. So <laughs> something, you know, like as in there's, you're obviously not saying everything in any relationship and um, it would be hard to, but you know, that's kind of the reality. Or it's, you know, big breakups that we see in press and all of that. So I would say there's also not that much middle ground. Spot on. Absolutely spot on. And I would completely agree with you. And this is where I just feel this natural um, calling, in a way, yeah. to sort of put a bit of a grenade under relationships and with the whole notion of honest relationshiping. And it's interesting you mentioned there about couple goals. Um, my husband sometimes features on my Instagram or podcast, not so much my podcast actually, because it's banned. Um, we don't, we, there's, there's a line, mm. you know, my husband's not in this industry. Um, but often people will uh, kindly comment and be like, oh gosh, you two, you know, hashtag couple goals. Um, I even went to the theatre the other night and uh, saw my very dear friend from Stuttgart dating Tom Reed Wilson. And he was like, oh my gosh, but someone told me you were here because they, they've just seen you and Alex, it's my husband. And they went, oh, they're just so in love. And I thought that was really interesting because what they didn't know is that we'd had a bloody great round the day yeah. before. And I think this, is, and it's, it's the nicest compliment when people say that. But as you say, Grace, there's a fine line between 
airing your dirty laundry in public, mm. which is not cool or mm. not, and it's not respectful within a relationship because what goes on behind closed doors yeah. ultimately should stay there mm. as long as it's safe. Um, but equally, it's really important. I think if people are kind enough to say, oh, wow, you and your husband, you seem to have the most perfect marriage. My God, what the hell is a perfect yeah. marriage? We row and we bicker. And I tell you, you know, without crossing a line and being too open about our relationship, he's probably going to listen to this, back to this. But I'm sure he won't mind me saying, because he's one of the co-founders of the relationship mm. place, we feel really strongly about it, that we, we have come from some absolute corkers over yeah. the last eight years where... My God, we've both probably fantasized about the divorce courts mm. and gone, is this worth it? You know, mm. is this worth it? And then you go back, you pause and you analyze your relationship in each other. And my God, a relationship is hard work and it should be work. A relationship yeah. that is paused and is on autopilot is not a healthy relationship. It's not. You have to keep moving. And you know what? Like, take that day, for example, at the theater. We, yeah, we'd, we'd had just a, a bit of tension that had, you know, just been bickering and bickering and had blown and uh we worked hard on that really hard on that mm. you know it took several days a week to really work through that conflict um and i'm happy to say that because i think god if people think you're a relationship coach on the telly you've got the relationship place with your husband but we struggle mm. and we have times but that is what you need you need to work on that and work out if you go left or you go mm. right and i think that as long as that's part of our perception of couple goals that's fine yes. the kind of idea of this healthy natural normal fact that not everything's going to be fine the whole time and actually part of it being fine is being able to have this healthy kind of debate and disagreeing it's two people living a life rather than one there's always right. going to be back and forth and one person who wants more contact at one time and one person who wants less and one person who yeah. feels like they really need support at one time and another one who always. feels like you know there's always it's going to be push and pull it's it's, it's passing the baton always mm. and and it and it is exactly about that it's it's it is that constant dialogue of what your needs are um and and where you both are you know we all have our ups and we all have our downs and relationships mm. can be really challenging yeah so a lot of your job now revolves around the idea of matchmaking you're obviously <laughs> you you're on celebs um go dating and um in terms of kind of matchmaking coaching people kind of through those relationships and, and those potential matches and that dating what would you say the biggest kind of common mistake people make when um when trying to find a kind of match slash dating hmm. okay so my number one pet hate and common mistake is my type is hates it hates it and woe betide anyone on our next series of Celebs Go Dating that trots that out. The very moment you say my type is, you are limiting everything outside of that type. And usually that type has come from previous experience. Mm -hmm. But guess what? If it's previous experience, you're not in that relationship anymore. So what? Are you wanting to go back to your past and recreate your past? Mm. That's often where we need to do some work on going, but if, if you want what you've had, but you haven't got any more, where are you heading? Mm -hmm. So for me, the most common mistake and the biggest mistake and my bugbear is people that are very narrow minded when it comes to their type, but limiting yourself with, with just saying, I only want someone that is tall, dark, handsome, blue eyes, does this for a job, mm. has a great family. You are completely limiting your possibilities. And so how do we draw the line between attraction mm. and what we're naturally attracted to and making sure that we're not kind of putting ourselves in this narrow-minded type box? Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about a lot really is, is aesthetics. People come up with what they, what they like the look of, mm -hmm. okay? But we all know that relationships are so much more than that. Yeah. I mean, my God, you know, if my husband married me just based on my looks, you know, when he sees me massively hungover and sleep deprived, I am not looking my mm -hmm. best. It's looking at the bigger picture. And really a relationship and matchmaking is a huge part of it is based on values. Okay. What is important to me? What do I stand for? If you were to strip me down, like with supervision, you know, laser eyes, what, what is important to me? What do I, you know, what... On my deathbed, if someone said, you know, what has been the most important part of your life? What have you cared about the most? That is where we elicit our top values. You know, mine uh, is family, it's communication, it's honesty, it's creativity. These are really important things to me. Um, 
And that is how we can look beyond the, I like someone that's got mm. black hair or someone yeah. that's blonde. That's fine. But there's so much more to that because all of that can be changed and probably will change. Mm. Attraction wanes. After we get through that six month, one year, if you're lucky, honeymoon phase, you've got to know where you're going. You've got to find that depth. And that is where your values come in. And if you match your values with someone else, that is where you should be absolutely beelining for because that will be create the foundation of your relationship. So I completely understand that. And I completely agree. I think when you think of dating someone for six months versus spending 30 years with them and potentially having children and all of these various different things, it's obviously what you want from those things will be very different. And in terms of the kind of longer term one, you're going to need a lot that's not related, obviously, to the way they look or the way they present themselves or the way they're kind of, you know, you're in first impressions of someone. And that is important, I'd like mm, to point out. Of it is, course. That is important too. But how, in the world of dating now, mm. bearing in mind, obviously, everyone can't get to know absolutely everyone before they, you know, decide that that person might be a good personality match for them. Mm. How do you then whittle it down in the types of scenarios that we generally meet people now? So it could be dating apps, it could be at a bar, it could be through friends. Obviously, you can analyse some, how someone looks slash their general kind of aura and all of these things much quicker than you can ascertain their personality and whether you'd get through having kids together. Mm -hmm. So how do you start to, I guess, widen that net without wasting your time so how do you mean as in how do you as in where else can you go I mean or how do you how do you elicit how, what okay. you want from someone so it's really easy to see someone's kind of yeah. aesthetics and how they right, look right, up front right so so if it's it's obviously relationships aren't about aesthetics at all the sexual attraction and attraction in general is important mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but of course it won't be that especially not mm -hmm. if you're you know talking particularly long term but I would say that aesthetics and the way people look is probably the easiest way that people first sure. kind of, of course. get that, to grips that, that, with yeah, that, that, that's, that's the initial attract. That's your hook. That's your in, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Although having said that, I always say to people, um, if they've gone on a first date, it's the representative that shows up. You know, you've, you've you know, probably, you know, you look better, you look good, you're a bit nervous, everyone's a bit, ooh. Um, that's great. And I always say, people go, mm, I'm not sure. If there is even a smidge of interest from you in that date, and you hope them, always go on that second date. Mm. That second date is so much more important than the first date because the second date is when they really show up. That's when you you start to really unpeel the layers. And when it comes to meeting someone and just based on that face of, of, uh, attraction and, and, okay, where am I going with this? It's the art of conversation is huge. Mm. Working out um, if someone aligns with you emotionally, is also really important. How do they speak? You know, where, what references do they come up with? Who do they refer to in their lives? You know, are they quite top line about stuff? Do they, are they vulnerable? Do they let their guard down? Do they tell you about certain things? Or, you know, where it's about sort of that little dance around um, working out what's important to them, you know, what information they give up. And really that is up down to us as well as the, as the data is offering that up because it's called mirror matching. If you give something, up to them offer something you know whether it be a fact or a question or a piece of your life have a look and see if they're offering that back if they're mirroring it and that is when you start to gauge rapport and you start to think okay there's a little bit of something with this I, I'm going to use guy in, in this scenario that is how you start to ascertain if there is a little bit of a, a connection kicking in um and I often go down you know it's 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 really important to arm yourself with good questions um, you know, not just, you know, what's your favorite film and stuff like that, but you know, where, you know, what's, you know, how would your friends describe you? You know, where mm. do you see yourself in five years? You know, and often asking sort of questions like, you know, what's the, what's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? You know, I quite like to suggest those questions because mm. when you ask those kind of questions, it gives you a little bit of an indication of how vulnerable they might be and how how honest they might be, uh, how self-deprecating they might be, or if they're just putting on this massive front uh, and not willing to go into that. That's how you can start to sort of unpack the layers. But really, the onus is really on yourself. It's how much you're willing to invest in that person and you hope that they will bring that back to you. Of course. And with the way dating works nowadays, yeah. I guess there's that, you know, there's that representative that turns up to the first date. But I yeah. would say even before that, there's a layer of representatives, probably the social media representative, there's the, which everyone has, whether dating or not, the dating app 
representation, mm. kind of all of these different things. There are a lot of different layers before you get to actual kind of sharing vulnerabilities um, yeah. and being at a point that you would consider actually knowing someone rather than probably knowing someone on the surface level. Mm -hmm. What do you think dating apps have done to the kind of world of dating in terms of how easy or hard it is to meet the right person? Yes, yeah, so I think that's the golden question mm. right now, particularly post pandemic. I am, um, I'm a fan of, of dating apps mm -hmm. uh, with a heavy caveat. And I think a lot of matchmakers, a lot of relationship experts um, would be pro them. Um, but I think we've all learned, you know, proceed with caution. I mean, there are so many around. And I think for me, the biggest advice I always give with dating apps is for you yourself know your intention behind why you are using that mm -hmm. dating app. Yeah. Um, some people will say go for it and go on loads. Okay, the more the more tennis balls you throw out there, the more it will stick. My personal advice, and it's just my advice, is I think less is more personally mm -hmm. because we get fatigued really damn quick on a dating app. There's only so many hey dick pics, you know time wasters that we yeah. can put up with before we get fatigued oh, it's a flipping waste of time i can't be bothered now you know there's going to be that gem in there well do you know there's going to be that there could be that gem yeah. in there statistically there's probably someone who you would be well there's going to be that gem but if you if you get fatigued very quickly you're just not going to want to mm. invest in it anymore and you're going to shut the app down and go oh, do you know yeah. what? i, I just i genuinely cannot imagine at this current time in my life, I cannot imagine having the time to flick through a dating app. Right. So I would suggest that less is more. And I would suggest go with one free one and maybe one paid one. Okay. It's a myth that people that pay for dating apps or, you know, that they're more intentional. Actually, research does suggest it is quite 50-50. Mm -hmm. But I would do that just to kind of hedge your bets. But really, this comes, you, this is the thing with dating relationships. You've got to own it yourselves. Mm. What am I looking yeah. for? What do I want? If you just want friends with benefits or, you know, companionship, a bunk up just to mess about with someone or an ego boost even mm. that's fine yeah but, but be clear and if you want a relationship be really clear with that a lot of people sort of go oh i don't want to come across death bro. i don't want to come across that yeah. game but it's not you're stating i mean if you believe in the whole put it out to the universe thing which i'm a big fan of but it, it how does someone know what you want if you don't tell them yeah well i always so my advice always to girlfriends and i think this is the the case we get a lot as you say people are like well i don't want him to think i'm too keen i don't want him to get scared but like they know they're looking for a relationship right and it's like that's completely fine you don't want to sit down and be like i don't know the first question be necessarily kind of like heavily in on kids yes. or marriage or dating should be a conversation not an interrogation right <laughs> but you also if someone has told you, if, if say you have a date with a guy and one of the first things they say is, I'm not interested in a relationship mm -hmm. and you're actually interested in a relationship, mm -hmm. changing what you think you want based on the fact that you think that you could either maybe get this person to kind of like change their mind mm -hmm. or it, you know, that will naturally happen and you don't necessarily want to kind of like scare them off. It's such self-sabotage. And it's just like Complete hurting self yourself. Complete self-sabotage. It makes me so angry. Complete self-sabotage. Uh, you, you pretty much said it there as well. You can never change somebody else and neither should we, mm. really. We can only change ourselves and how we perceive ourselves and what we do. And in that scenario, exactly, you know, if, if you go and I want a relationship and you've been clear about that, mm. now that isn't that, do you know what, that's sexy. Mm. Being confident is sexy. So you putting it out there and saying on your bio or wherever it may be, or even in an actual one-to-one -one chat or even face-to-face -face saying, I'm looking for a relationship. I'm looking for marriage. I'm mm. looking for children. That's not being heavy or desperate or anything like that. That is being confident. And if that person comes back going, I'm not, yeah. I would go, thanks for your time. Then this is gonna, this is not for either of us, mm. you know, because neither of you are wrong in that scenario. But or thinking that I can change that person, you are going down a very rocky mm. road. Yeah, because I always think that it's going to, that's going to come out at some point. Always what does. What you want. Always does. And therefore, you can very much, because I feel like there will always be a scenario where you think like, yeah, no, I am really looking for a relationship, but I'm happy. I think this person's really nice and I'd be happy to kind yeah. of like date them, maybe friends with benefit, maybe just like see where it goes for a while, even though I know they're not. But like, like I always, always, always think, and I think that we really naturally kind of probably slightly lie to ourselves in Completely. being like, well, there's a chance that whatever. 
Yeah, it, and I and I exactly that, and I and I understand that. Mm, I understand that, particularly if he's someone you really do like, yeah. and you think, God, oh, like you know, in your mind, you're like, I, I really, I want to, I want to hedge my bets. You know, will this person grow into this? You know, will I be so fabulous that they will mm. fall in love with me? You know, and 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 I get that, but actually, I've never really actually divulged it, but it, it sort of feels quite natural to now. I've been in that scenario, mm. um, and without sort of you know being disrespectful it's not but you know talking about a previous relationship but before I got married obviously um I was in a relationship <laughs> my yeah, yeah, my, <laughs> yeah. but my previous relationship um I very much wanted the whole the whole package mm. you know from from him uh and I made it very clear you know from from early on you know that I that my life goal you know my intention in life was to get married and have children it was mm. really important to me still is I'm thrilled I have that now um but um and to be fair to to the guy I was with this is a five-year relationship he didn't sell me the dream mm. initially um I think sometimes he, we could sell ourselves right yeah. exactly and he um for his own reasons it wasn't something that was on his radar for for you know he had his own opinions around that and he'd never told me that that was something he could definitely commit mm. to so I did know that. And honestly, yeah, I mean, I how old was I? I, mean, I was 30, 30, mm. 29, 30. Um, absolutely. There was a part of me that was like, oh, he'll change his mind. Or hoping he'd change his mind. You know what? Right now it's good. Like to, to, to bail this relationship mm. when I've got all the feels and, you know, I'm so into this guy yeah. and he's into me. But I know that look, I stayed. But actually what ended up happening was that, you know, three, four years into that relationship, all my friends around me were getting engaged, you know, and as much as we should never measure ourselves against others, which we really yeah, shouldn't, I'm wanted. human, yeah. it's what I wanted. And it got to that point of, right, are you, were you serious about that or not? And then I, there, was lot, there was a lot of indecision around mm. that, you know, I was sort of being fed a bit of a, and I can understand probably wanting to fit into that mold mm. for me, but if that's not truly no, in you, yeah. you can't do it. And and guess what happened? Hey, mm. unfortunately, that relationship ended because we were on different paths. And it was the most heartbreaking breakup, really, mm. because no one did anything wrong. Yeah. Um, I wanted that. He didn't. Mm. And no one was right or wrong with that. But ultimately, the relationship broke down. And there I was at the age of 33, 34, single and living with myself again and really not wanting to be in that situation. So what would you say to someone now who was in a relationship where they know that they want something quite different in terms of lifestyle, for example, marriage and kids within mm. the next few years, mm. and they know the person they are with isn't like completely against it, mm. but probably sees it more in 10 years mm. than they do in the next few years. Mm. When do you know that it's the time to probably break it off, understand you want different things and kind of find that elsewhere if that's something that's really important to you mm -hmm. or when to stick it out based on the fact that that could you know be a really amazing relationship when the desire for what you want and what you feel is a very huge part of your life mm. and the next stage of your life when you are at that point where you are not you are not matching there mm. it's incongruent and what i would suggest this happens a lot to people it's a big question um is relationships are going to have difficult conversations. Oh my God, for me, I've just spoken myself. Horrible, very difficult conversation. And there does come a point where you just have to be uh, as honest as you possibly can. And really, it, there's no right or wrong answer with this because it ultimately comes down to personal choice. Mm. But if someone cannot promise you or with complete conviction say that they can make that step with you then you really do have to unfortunately work out what's what's most important in your mm. life is is that person of being with them or is the desire to have what they can't offer you i.e marriage and children you know how big a deal really is that to your life you know i do know some people that have stayed together they've wanted the marriage and the kids and actually it hasn't been reciprocated but they have stayed and actually mm. they've 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 found their way in a different way in that relationship, and it's been equally fulfilled. And yeah. I think that's the key word here: fulfilled. What? Where is your? Where is your goal? Your relationship goal? Your life goal? Are you aligned at any point? And where is that compromise? Um, 
but sometimes you do have to have these really difficult conversations and uh, it can hurt like hell in that moment where you have to make them and you never know no one knows what the future holds you know I've had some people do that they've bailed their relationship mm. say bail that's a bit harsh but they've, they've exited yeah. it and then they can't have children mm. you know so there, there are so many variables but I think it's all about what makes you feel fulfilled and and, and individually knowing how much this person means to you. You know, I've equally had people and know people that, you know, one of them's been absolutely vehement. They don't want kids, absolutely not. And yet they've met this person and, and suddenly it's all clicked for them. Mm -hmm. And they've gone, I've just never met someone that I really wanted that experience with. So it is so subjective, but it really is about keeping that constant conversation and dialogue going and just having the balls to be really honest with each other, even if it hurts, because all it will do is hurt down the line. Mm. All you're doing is just literally kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Don't no, be me. I, yeah. <laughs> Don't be me. Seriously. And you know what's interesting? When I then met my now husband, which was very soon after, I did actually know my husband before, um, whilst I was, uh, before I actually got together yeah. with him. And uh, we met, married, got pregnant, had babies in 18 months. Mm. It was a bit of a whirlwind, actually. I mean, I was, I'm not saying I was desperate. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> we did fall in love very quickly. But actually, it was one of the first questions that, I yeah. brought to the table, literally to the table. I, I think that's the thing. I think that it's with dating and relationships, what I've always felt like, as I've, I feel like everyone's made a lot of mistakes. They've, you know, you have to make mistakes. You have to kind of, the way you learn in relationships, the way you learn what you need and want and all of these things is by making mistakes. Grace, there is no failure, only feedback. And I, I love live that. by that rule. I absolutely love that. And I would also say that kind of, I think we expect, or I definitely have friends that get quite frustrated that they not necessarily make the same mistakes over and over, but mm. it's like you expect probably after like your third relationship that's been like a year long, there would be certain things that wouldn't recur. And then when they do recur, it's really frustrating because you're like, oh, so like mm. I've just, you know, say wasted my own time. Mm. But actually that idea that each time you just learn a little bit more about yourself and about what you want and about Always. the kind of direction you want to go in, mm -hmm. I think is so important. Very important. And actually what it sounds like you're saying as well is never live with regrets. Mm. And I know it sounds such a cheesy thing to say, but, but really don't. Um, everything that we go through is a learning experience. And, you know, we say this on Slow Go Dating, I say it to private clients, you know, even when you are down in the trenches, you know, I've been in the trenches in an abusive mm. relationship, and yet I've still asked myself that question and flipped it into a positive, what have I learned about myself, about that relationship? And then the big question, what would I do differently? Mm. And you know what? All it takes in life and, and is, is that one person. Maybe that's true. You know, hey, people get divorced as well and they mm. move on, you know. And, and that's also okay. Um, but never look back. I think, and this is, I think this is the thing. You know, so many people bring their in their world their failures into the future into a present and and it's sort of as my dad would always put it you walk in you're walking in the door backwards you know you're already exiting yeah. before you've gone in it's really just appreciating and respecting every situation you've been in and actually I mean this sounds a bit therapy and I did sort of you know make peace with this but genuinely one of the I even said this in space the the abusive ex those many years ago I, I'll do it I thanked him thanks not thanks for being an abusive bastard mm. and don't you dare do that to anyone else again because it's a bit of a sad pathetic person to do that but I thanked him because I'm so much better mm. as a person I'm so much happier so much more fulfilled and my god I would never have got into talking therapy if mm. it hadn't been from that experience and I think that's a really um helpful way of putting ourselves forward particularly when it comes to dating relationships because often we will attach the same um negative attributes to somebody before we even start a new relationship no you know, absolutely people go, oh all men are bastards mm. or no oh, they're not mm. no they're not mm. and so how do you get into a new relationship and learn and move forwards and keep those learnings with you mm. without having certain preconceptions slash you know past damage applied to your new relationships or new dating it's communicating and learning mm. with each other, learning what our styles are, learning what any triggers are and being really honest and vulnerable about that. Um, you know, we we all carry scars, you know, I think. Well, most, a lot of us do. Um, but this is where working as a, a partnership is really, really important. Mm. And also recognizing yourself when something from your past might be uh, 
causing an issue mm-hmm. or a challenge within your new relationship and having that conviction to saying to your partner, oh, it's feeling like X, Y, Z right now and I kind of need some help with this or can you help me? I'm feeling a bit insecure, for example, about this. Um, what can you do to help me with that? And it is really doing that dance together um, in order to keep promoting security within the relationship. Honesty, truth, trust, transparency, these are all key ingredients for any relationship. And the minute I see a relationship start to come on the skids, it's why I've created a relationship place in particular because conflict is huge, always tends to be that we're missing some of those key ingredients. Um, and that is what, and, and that's when we start to self doubt um, and we start to get ourselves into rather gray territory. So it really is about making sure that communication is a positive, but also learning how each other communicate. You know, we do all communicate in different ways. I actually like to communicate, um, even though I talk a lot, as you can probably tell, I like to communicate by the written word. I find I can really convey what I'm Mm. feeling. I'm quite kinesthetic. I can convey that. My husband hates it. Mm. Literally the one thing that pisses him off is if I send him a long diatribe text. It really pisses him off. Speaking face to face and you know verbally, even on the phone, is how he can use communicates better. Now that can be quite difficult sometimes mm. because we have two different communication preferences, which we all can as well. We all have different arguing preferences. Mm. My husband's Italian; he's quite fiery. Bang, he's out. He's out there. But you know, he wants to he wants to talk that out there. I like to kind of go away, think about mm. it, pause, and come back with reasoning. You know, so we're going to jar. We're going to conflict with each other. That's why we felt so passionate about creating the business. So it's learning about how each other communicates best and then how you can then work your way back and compromise and how they can compromise. So it might be in my scenario, um, I'm feeling a certain way, something's pissed me off or I'm feeling a bit insecure or down or worried or whatever I need to discuss with him. I know that I can message him and just say, look, I'm feeling this way, Zed, can we have a chat about it? Sure, should we talk about it later when we're cooking dinner or something, you know, and we can talk about it face to face. Um, and it's the same for him, you know, he will, and, and, and that's and that's really where you do this dance. It's just about checking in with each other at all times and recognizing, like we said right at the beginning, we're all different, you know, be, be, it will be very, a healthy relationship is a relationship that bickers, it really is, because naturally we all have different opinions on mm. things in life. Yeah. You know, it would be very weird and mm. I've never met anyone that's dated or married mm. the, the carbon copy person. Mm. Um, so that's okay, but you just, it's learning how to communicate effectively. 100%, I think that's very good advice. Mm. I'm going to get the questions out. The oh. questions from the Instagram. So, oh, I feel like I've had a billion already. I know. Here this place. Here but thankfully, it. and luckily for you and everyone else involved, do you we have questions. Yeah, that's you know, really disappointing for me. Well, um, um, sorry, podcasters. Me. No, I've just seen that monitor, and for the big moment, I thought it was me. Uh, and I was really happy with the look. And then I realised I'm looking at a monitor that's got your face on it and hair, not mine. You look amazing. Um, oh, I'm highly disappointed in that. Well, I was like, God, that. I look hot. Oh, no, that'd be great. So, right, come on, what what the listeners ask for? For context for people listening, Mm -hmm. I have asked my Instagram what the main questions they'd like to know from a dating and relationships expert are. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna go at them. There'll be some with longer answers, some with shorter answers, (laughs) but I've read them them, (laughs) and this is also entirely selfish. Once again, this whole podcast is about me just being able to speak to people um, that I want answers from. Grace, that is the prerogative of having a podcast. Mm, I have one myself. and that's, Free advice. That's, yeah, exactly. You can do what you damn well like with your own podcast. So, question number one. Go on. Is the love language stuff bullshit? <laughs> um, no, I'm a huge fan of love languages. I think it is the key to a successful relationship. I really do. I think if you can fathom out what your love language is and what your partner's love language is, you have basically hit the jackpot. Mm. The it's, a, it's a cheat jackpot. code. It's a massive cheat code. It's helpful for, because I think obviously the thing is, is likelihood is even if you, you're going to differ in some ways. Mm. Um, mm. Probably, you know, different relationships are obviously different. But what happens if you have love languages that are completely different? I mean, that's fine. It's just learning how to tune into those. Mm. Um, it, and, and our love languages can can move around the hierarchy. A love language is, by its definition, is how do you receive love? And how do you give love? Um, you know, for me, my number one love language is acts of service. Mm. Um, honestly, all my husband has to do is load the dishwasher without asking. And, you know, he, he, he's on, you know, he's, he's on for it. Um, my husband, it's quality time, you know, for him he really 
appreciates that quality time when I put the phone down, you know, and I'm actively in to him. Um, and the minute you tap into your partner's love language, um, good things happen. Okay, I'm gonna find good ones. One second. Good, I probably won't know the answer to it. You're if I don't, I'll just say pass. Okay, can you talk about commitment issues and right. what they really mean? So I guess what this person means is, you know, we hear a lot about commitment issues. Mm. We hear a lot about people who have commitment issues. Mm. What does that mean? And should you, can you still go for someone, say if they, if they, you think has commitment issues or maybe they self-profess to have commitment issues? So commitment issues are typically steeped in past evidence, past mm. situations, past trauma even. Something will be driving that commitment issue. Maybe they have been on the receiving end of parents that divorced. Maybe they have witnessed commitment in a really negative way. Typically, they have. That is why they have commitment issues. Or it could be that they just are not feeling that they are in that right space at this time in their life uh, to commit. And that can often be down to just, you know, personal progression, um, headspace, anything they might be grappling with, their life goals. You know, perhaps, you know, it, it's perfectly okay for someone that, <clears throat> is really, really geared into work, you know, and doesn't want a, a, a committed relationship because they feel in some way that will hinder them being able to 100% focus on work, which is fair because you have to really give a lot of time to a relationship too. But if someone says they have commitment issues, I would be interested to know if, some, if and why someone trotted that out mm. as a statement. And I would want to delve into that because mm. often it's often a defense mechanism as well yeah. it's almost a I'm just going to put you over here at arm's length mm. so I'm telling you right now that I'm not going to be vulnerable mm -hmm. that's what I hear yeah. really when people say that is I'm not ready to be vulnerable what I would say to someone on the receiving end of that don't run into the trap of being the rescuer Okay, now I'm guilty mm. of being a It's not a, a challenge. <laughs> Someone's saying they have challenge. commitment issues. It's not a challenge right. for you to overcome. Right, exactly. That is for them to work out, mm. okay? And it's not for you to prove to them that you are worthy of their commitment. Um, I would say proceed with caution, but I would say probably more proceed with curiosity mm. on where that comes from. But always you yourself know on what your um, goals are with regards to commitment. And, I would say and what this, you expect from them in return. And if they can't, if they don't want to even, even explore commitment, that's mm. fine. But that's important to you. So that perhaps is that person is not for you. I also think there's a big difference between someone who has commitment issues and is expressing that potentially because they need to be almost vulnerable and say, I have commitment issues, FYI, I'm trying to work through them. I like you. Mm -hmm and someone who has commitment issues and says that almost as a either a light rejection right <laughs> or a kind of get or, out or of jail I'm just doing this for one thing yeah it's exactly. a get out of jail it's a I literally just you know yeah. I want to have sex and then either and way it. it's fine either way it's fine but the vocalization of it is obviously very different and I think it can almost be someone saying being vulnerable and saying I know this is my big issue right. I know what I need to get through Really, really good point. It's really knowing what the intention is behind that statement. As you say, if someone is vulnerable saying, I really like you, but I have commitment issues, that's very different to someone going, just so you know, yeah, I've, got We're, I've got commitment issues, yeah, yeah. so I'm just in this for one thing. Very, very different. And that's just, just translate it. That's someone saying that they're not for going for something which serious. Is Absolutely fine. Which is fine. But that's why I'd say proceed with curiosity. Mm -hmm. Rather than judging, curiosity of what do they mean by mm. that? Where's that come from? I also often think that we can't, we think that we can't clarify something, mm -hmm. whereas if you, you very much can. I think there's this, probably this idea, and I don't know whether this was just me, but when I was a teenager, I very much, I think, over glorified the, probably like the authority of guys in a relationship because it would be like, you were really lucky to have a boyfriend when you okay. were like a teenage girl. Okay. And so I, I think that yeah. I kind of yeah. definitely had that. You're when right. I was younger, it was mm. very much like, um, I was much less likely to question, much less likely to clarify this whole kind of like, what if they think that I'm, mm. you know, 
like too into it or like any of these things which obviously and naturally as you grow up yeah, yeah you, uh, you understand yeah. but one of the in terms of being able to clarify just being like do you just to get this straight mm. when you say you have commitment issues are you saying that you don't want to commit and you're happy with your commitment issues and this is not you mm. know this is not a longer term thing or are you saying that you have commitment issues, you're aware of your... And you'd like to work for Exactly. It. Yeah. And that is really, really key because, like I say, it's all about where that statement's come from. And, mm. and what you do with that information is very different. Mm. Um, like I say, if it is the one that's, I have commitment issues because I have trauma in my life and, you know, blah, 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 blah. proceed with caution um, and don't go into rescuer, but absolutely hold their hand Mm. Um, if it's something because it shows vulnerability and that they're wanting it's what it, it what you hope is is that what they're saying is that you are someone I would even be prepared to dip that toe in but mm. I'm actually a bit scared because mm. I'm not sure how to get there and I'm telling you because I actually respect you that I have had commitment issues in the past and it is something that frightens me now I'm not saying you're gonna have a happily ever after but actually that relationship potentially could be one of the strongest mm. and most Starting powerful from the point of vulnerability. right powerful issues that, that ever happened you know, coming from that, from coming from that. Why do you think people are ghosting hmm. a lot nowadays? And how should people deal with that on the dating scene? Mm, great question. Um, I've got no time for ghosting. I mean, who has, right? Um, ghosting is disrespectful, essentially. Mm. Overall, it's disrespectful. And on Celebs Go Dating, for example, if someone does, you know, the kind of the Celebs Go Dating version of ghosting, i.e. just sort of bails out of a date and feeds them a bit of, you know, bullshit and doesn't own it, we make them go back and write that wrong. Yeah. Okay. It's okay to not like someone. 100%. We won't like everyone. Just be respectful and say. And you know what? I never in my experience has someone politely and respectfully told someone, you know what? this isn't working for me or it's not quite what I'm looking for or you're not what I'm looking for, but thank you for your time. Never have I ever experienced someone be upset with that response. No. And yet every time, everybody is upset with Ghosting. the nothing. Because what that does is it plays into our insecurities. Mm. What, well, is it, is, straight away, is it me? Well, it must be me. They've just, they've just literally picked me up and dropped me. It, I think it's one of the most... The, the worst things about the dating scene actually is the ghosting. Why are so many people doing it? That's a great question. I believe it's because they can, yeah, because there's easy. so much choice out there. You don't have to have integrity. And but, it shows integrity to say to someone, no thanks. And I guess as well, if we're talking about a dating scene where, um, you know, online dating has become more and more prevalent, um, the idea of ghosting is obviously, okay, you might go on one day, think you get on really well, and then one person decides to ghost. It's obviously, before it might have been that you would have bumped into someone and said, oh, you know, like, I don't think this is the thing. Whereas you'd have to arrange maybe like a second second date mm. or message someone. Mm. And people feel like it maybe might be a bit much to message someone after a first date and just be like, kind of go all in. What I kind of feel about ghosting is that it's not just a lack of respect to that other person. And what I, I would kind of call it cowardice. I don't know if that's like unfair. I think it's the easiest option. Like it's the easiest option mm. out. But I also think that it's like not respecting yourself mm. because there's no way anyone actually feels good about ghosting someone. Mm. You have every right to not want to talk to someone or to not want well, to date someone. And if you do feel good about it, then I would seriously, yeah, question, probably seriously different, question probably a different your issue. Uh, sociopath but I tendencies. I yeah. also think that it's like a lack of respect for, your, for yourself mm -hmm. being able to have difficult conversations. Right. No one wants to openly reject someone. If you're a good person, you probably don't want to openly reject someone, potentially hurt someone's feelings, but not being able to respect yourself and that other person enough to have the, to literally just say, hey, had a great time. I think you can say, you, there are so many easy outs. So there are so outs. many kind of like, oh, I actually think this is better on like a friend basis. You know, you're not going to be friends with that mm. person. Although I, well, but, I, what I would say is on that, on that one, 
I would say don't give false hope either. Mm. I know it's an easy, right, right, it's right. an easy, in and I'm not, and I'm not, well, I am pulling up on it, but not, but only in a, in a, I hope, helpful way. Yeah. Because everyone does trot that okay, out. Saying, but it's an easy cop out. Saying but, not romantic rather than exactly, we should be friends. Exactly. You're a great person. I mean, this is, you're a great person. I mean, if you felt that. Um, even if you had a stinking day, I would, but you're absolutely right, Grace. It says, so much about ourselves on how we handle those difficult situations and almost that whole you know as, as granny always used to say you know treat others as you'd like to be treated mm -hmm. yourselves but i really think that you know that is really really good advice um there's nothing worse you know and if someone and i'm sure it's happened to me you know something I mean, i've been ghosted before way way back in the day back in the dark ages grace um <laughs> but i really respect someone going actually it's you know you're not for me or it's not for mm. me or I'm just not actually feeling like I'm in the right space actually to take this any further but and this is the thing this is for anyone that's thinking about ghosting firstly don't do it but the the best thing to do at the end of that awkward conversation if you're feeling it or message is just thank them mm. thank them for their time thank them for showing up thank them for taking interest thank you so much for the day you know whatever you want to say I also just think it's quite a good life exercise to get used to needing to have difficult conversations hugely it's the easiest one it's like the if you're gonna need to let people go from work or mm. go kind of whatever it might be that you, there are so many difficult conversations you're gonna have in your life. Get some practice in and tell yes. someone after you went on one date that it just wasn't the right thing. No. And like grow as a person, use grow your maturity. As a person. It, it, exactly, and honestly, uh, it it really pleases me when I see I've, we've made people do it you know in in the moment and they all absolutely they're sweating they're nervous they can't have that difficult conversation every time when they've had a difficult conversation the person in question who they've said thanks but no thanks to has really appreciated mm. it at the very least base level they've gone thanks mm. for actually having the decency to tell me that I'm a big girl big boy I can take it sort of thing and you know what like you say they've always felt better about themselves they've grown yeah, no, I think that is so important. And how, when you are in a relationship and it's going well and it's probably been going well for a while, how do you know it's quote unquote the one? Ooh. Um, when you've got someone to do everything with, but they are the person you like to do nothing with. As in, they're just someone that you love being around, okay? Love is a cocktail, really. Intimacy, passion, and commitment. And if you have those three ingredients in your relationship, then that is a relationship that's a stayer. Intimacy, really important, but intimacy is always, isn't it? It's, it's sexual intimacy, it's romantic in intimacy, it's uh, intellectual intimacy, emotional intimacy, um, passion, obviously, that's the physical side of things, yeah, and, uh, and commitment. It's uh, wanting to be with that one person over anybody else romantically. Mm. And what do you think then about the fact that I'm sure people can be in that situation and love their partner and love their relationship? Understandably, after, you know, a while, it might it might feel like the grass is greener and it might not necessarily be because there are any issues within the kind of relationship. I think particularly within young relationships, if you've been with mm. someone for a long time and ne don't necessarily have a lot of comparative factors, it's probably quite easy to start thinking at points like oh I wonder if this really is the one mm -hmm. how do you think you start kind of working out whether it's yes I've got those three things but actually I might be more suited to someone in terms of their ambition or what they want to do with their lives or any of these things mm -hmm. or just saying actually no relationship's perfect I've got all of these three things I love doing life with them I love doing nothing and everything and all of these things with them how do you know the difference so you need to add into all of that your values again and your goals. Where are we heading? You know, what does? Um, I always like to give people their, their, their dream day um, and asking each other that in five years time, 10 years time, where are you? What are you doing? Who are you with? You know, picture it, literally picture the scene. You know, what does that scene look like? Um, are you with that person with three kids? Are you traveling the world with a backpack on your, you know, back? But that way you can just realign and drill down again. Why are we together? Mm. You know, what has brought us together? Relationships change and they evolve and our goals change, but it's always about communicating back in. In fact, my husband and I did it recently. He was just like, what are your dreams? And I was like, I can't really get a question. I don't know. I haven't even had a chance to break wind, let alone 
think of my dreams. Um, and he was like, what are our dreams together? And actually it was in those moments. And, and I thought we were on a long car journey and I was thinking about it for a while. I was like, come on, great question, Al. I haven't really thought about that for a while. And I was like, well, what are yours? And, you know, he explained, you know, he had a few kind of goals that he wanted for us, a couple goals as well as, in, you know, interdependent relationship mm. is a successful one, one that exists outside the relationship as well as within it. And he said, but what are our couple goals? He's got his own personal ones. I've got my own personal ones. I was like, oh, yeah, it's a good one. And actually it took me a couple of days to really think about it. Um, and then I was like, you know, I was thinking about that. I said, I think in the next three years, this is our three year plan. I'd like us to do X, Y, Z. Well, that's really important because I think sometimes, and I speak for myself, you get so caught up in your one track, mm. you know, this is my life and hey, that's your life over there. And we'll just sort of throw each other together. And kids really do change a relationship as well. You know, there's barely any time for anything. Um, but it's really important just to keep checking in. And I would say, yeah, for a long-term relationship, if you're thinking, you know, where are we heading with this? It's about that. And if and if creating those joint goals, does that create excitement? Tune into your emotions and your feelings mm. on that. Does it make you go, mm. if it does, then well, have a think about that. You know, mm. why are you go, mm. maybe you are not fulfilled in that relationship, perhaps. Or do you think maybe some people are programmed to like change more and therefore maybe aren't programmed for being with someone for 30 years and could just be? Quite possibly. Yeah, we're all di we're all very different beasts, you know. Mm. I'm a huge fan of relationships and of marriage. I'm also a fan of divorce mm. in, in the right circumstances, um, because sometimes that does happen. You know, mm. we're all. But what I would say is never beat yourself up about that. But also, if you get to that point where you've perhaps evolved and you've changed to a point where you really do feel like you have different things, and you know, and life plays a huge part of that, doesn't it? You know, we go through situations and scenarios which change us and can change some people more than others. Grief bereavement, you know, all, all, all kinds of things can happen that can just move us, you know, jobs and things like that. And we can come to a point where we're like, actually, that's why we did the make or break plan in the relationship place, because it's about going, what have we got? Mm. And where are we heading separately or together? And really having that, you know, thrash it out of what you've got together, or sometimes realizing that actually we've had our time and it's yeah. time to move on and that's okay I think mm. I think people are kind of scared of that too and I think people associate relationship breakdown with something traumatic and mm. big and explosive as oh he's cheated on me and I'd always say if you are feeling like that and you really have tried everything to try and um exhaust sounds like a negative word but exhaust that relationship yeah. as in if it is and you really and you really feel that actually no this relationship isn't for you anymore that's okay yeah. do it respectfully before you end up going down a route of your eye wandering or you know you start not communicating or ghosting within mm. your relationship and then it all just breaks down anyway it takes a brave person to recognize that before mm. you get down those oh, trenches it really yeah. does social media <laughs> here yes. we go yes so I think there's a few different questions I want to ask around this and that there have been so many questions around social media. Okay. The first is someone who said, I've been with my boyfriend for six months mm. and he's got a regular Instagram and he hasn't posted me at all. Mm. <laughs> is that concerning? <sighs> hmm. Okay. My gut instinct on this, we have three brains, our head, our heart and our gut. Gut's always the most correct, is yes. However, there's always a caveat because I don't know these people and I don't know this person. So a regular guy, so he's, I mean, mm, the reason why I'm going, mm, is I actually have a very good friend of mine that's going for a very similar situation. Slightly longer term relationship, but doesn't exist on said Instagram profile. Mm. Um, I would certainly... Put it this way, that person sent that question in because it doesn't feel right. Yeah, right. Okay. So true. the minute that something doesn't feel right, your instinct is usually correct. Mm. Okay. And then we move into this whole territory of, do they think maybe I'm being controlling? Mm. You know, because I want to be honest. Do they think I'm being possessive? Do they think yeah. I'm being too strong? So what we're talking about there is self-doubt is starting to creep in. What I'd ask to this person who sent that question in, does she post her boyfriend, her mm. six month relationship? Does she post him on her Instagram? Or does he post other things at a regular interval that are important to him? Right, and that's the key. 
what does he post? If he just doesn't post anything... Mm, or just post work, or, or just post... Right. And you if know, he, it's not personal. Exactly. If he is consistent in his approach, if it's just, yeah, exactly that. Um, There's a day out and you're suspiciously missing from the <laughs> one photo that you've right. in. Or he's posting everything else in his life that mm. matters to him. So work, it isn't just like a work account. So that's fair enough. You know, I've got a friend of mine who's a big interior designer. So their Instagram feed yeah, is, yeah, is no, Instagram. So, you know, they're not going to suddenly, you know, post no a picture of her and her husband in a hot tub. You know what I mean? It, it's just, it's just <laughs> incongruent. It yeah. just doesn't work on her social media. But if someone, um, and I do not, lots of people like this, that on their social media, they will post everything that matters to them, their kids, their families, their moms, you know, on the toilet, you know, or whatever it may be. And then they are the one person missing. Mm -hmm. Then yes, I would have a concern. I would. Because, so I would then ask the question of, can I ask why, why you don't put me on my Instagram? Um, you might be met with, why does it matter and everything mm. like that. And I guess that's the other question to ask yourself. Why is it important to me? Mm. And it sounds to me like this person is validation. It's validation within that relationship. It's validation and respect within him and everything that encompasses him. Yeah. And also just the fact that if it's something that's like, if, if he naturally posts a lot of other things, then if there's a kind of gaping hole, then it does raise the question. And I think it's one of those difficult things because those types of things are the things that we're programmed to think that it's, it's often angled as either over controlling or mm. kind of stupid things that mm. don't matter mm. but it's I think probably in this person's case it sounds like it's less about the actual fact that they're not on it more about the principle of like oh <laughs> I wouldn't mind being on it or not but the principle of the fact that you're also say posting all of the other things that you're interested in or every weekend or all of this and I'm Right. I happen to not be there when I'm probably spending most time with you. That yeah. sounds like a deliberate thing. And also there could very much be something where it's like, actually, I really like to keep my private life private. Which is why the conversation is worth having. Yeah. Um, it's worth having. I mean, my husband doesn't really post me. Mm. Uh, on. Well, he's not really that active, but I, he's not yeah, that active yeah. on Instagram. And but, but again, if that was an issue for me, I would... Have a, because you never know. This, this is the thing. This is why I don't bang on and on about communication. But communication, lack of communication, it's the mother of all efforts. Ask the question. And then you will also know and be dictated and led by the answer and the response and the tone and everything else that comes with that. You know, the response that, oh my God, like, um, oh God, yeah, I'd love to. I just didn't think you wanted to be. Like, I just didn't really. There could be a million answers for that. But you'll know. If there's a defensive response, that's a flag. So, how, when you know, when you, okay, so you've been dating someone for a little bit, you've been on four dates with them, mm. and you start to understand through these four dates and spending a bit of time without them elsewhere that they're not going to be right for you because of a few big or medium sized red flags. <laughs> how do you stop thinking about that person's potential? in terms of what it could be or what they could be when you know that realistically potential isn't, it's not, it's not real. It's not how they actually are now. I mean, first off, I would never ever ignore a red flag. Mm -hmm. And there are no such thing as a medium red flag. There is a flag, there might be an amber flag, but never a red flag. Um, we can maybe, Proceed with caution on one, if I'm mm -hmm. honest with you. I have to slightly contradict myself there. Never ignore the second. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're four dates in and we are seeing flags, you confront them. You make them aware of something that you have spotted or experienced that you're not happy with or that has concerned you or whatever it may be. Again, you judge that response. If it is a response that is defensive, and shuts you down, get the hell out of there. If it is a response that is genuinely open, um, wanting to improve, uh, to change, to work on whatever that uh, flag may be. And that's why I say, I kind of contradict myself a little bit. There are some, maybe I'm saying like amber ones, you know, so, you know, people come with, past mm, baggage. Course. 
So be wary of them. Don't rule them out, but it all depends on how much that person is prepared to work mm-hmm. on that and the response. But red flags should always be acted on. So let's talk about red flags. Go on then. What would you say are some of the biggest red flags at the beginning of dating someone? Actions not matching the words. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, you know, Grace, I just, you know, I'm so into you. I'm just, I can't wait to see you tomorrow. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. <laughs> Brilliant. And then you don't hear from him. Maybe for oh, a yeah. week. Maybe for a week. When <laughs> it's so strange. You're right, yeah. And then a week later, and then you're sitting there going, did I imagine that? Like, he was really into me. Like, yeah. you know, but like, I'm a pretty good judge of character. Like, he was really into me. Uh, you know, message, you know, nothing, nothing. Then a week later, oh my God, sorry, I've been bullshit excuse insert. Uh, and then it was all over you again. So it's actions matching words. Are they going to do what they say they're going to do? That's the one thing that I would watch out for. And if they don't, don't give them any chances because they're stringing you along. Um, so that's one of them. I would say... Um, Respectful language. I mean, this probably sounds like an obvious one, but you'd be surprised how many people make excuses for that. Mm. You know, what is appropriate uh, language for you um, that you feel comfortable around? Um, You know, you should never accept anybody that... I mean, I get so tired with this whole, I want to go out with a bad boy, you know, type vibe. And it's because bad boys, whoever we describe a bad Mm. boy, probably been to jail or something, you know. (laughs) I don't know. It's because they're exciting and it's because they are nonchalant and they don't care about life. And that can be exciting. Um, But also, you know, watch out for that. Watch out for someone that is kind of on their own mission and Mm. you're just sort of being dragged along for the ride. Um, I think that's also a really important one. What about green flags? Mm. Ones at the beginning of a relationship or dating Mm -hmm. that you think, great, go ahead. Someone that lets you in. In all ways, emotionally, physically, that shows their vulnerable side. Someone that is open to learning, open to own mistakes. You know, what we're talking about is is vulnerability. That is the ultimate green flag. And I spend so much time trying to help people see the strength in being vulnerable, not in shutting it down. Um, That's a real green flag, yeah. Mm, I love that one. If you know, what what do you feel about attachment types? If you know that you're someone who is more likely to become codependent mm. within a relationship, mm. <laughs> how do you acknowledge that and stop yourself from doing that? Or do you think in the right situation you should be able to be not necessarily codependent, but with someone who allows you to kind of feel somewhat codependent by being strongly interdependent? Okay, so codependency, I think we we need to be careful mm-hmm. of codependency. Um, interdependency is, is the holy grail, okay? So that is having the uh, individuality, you know, owning your own life, you know, enjoying life outside of the relationship, your own set of friends, your own work goals, your own social goals. And then... There's the interpart. So I mean, we, we touched on it earlier. You know, the how it operates as a couple, okay? Not being too dependent on that other person for your happiness or anything. And that's the key. It's not solely putting your eggs in one basket, you know, which is kind of codependency. My happiness or safety or security oh. and, you know, everything else uh, is dependent on that person providing for me. So I think when you talk about attachment styles, you know, yeah, it's like secure attachment. So... The, the holy grail is to make sure you keep that boundary around interdependence mm. and recognize when you might be coming dependent on your partner for certain things. Mm. And as the partner, if you are feeling like your partner is becoming quite dependent on you, it is helping them to expand what they need to feel a bit more independent outside of the, the uh, inter side of the relationship. And if you know that you're someone who is who naturally kind of falls into that codependency, probably, I don't know, because of either past traumas mm. or abandonment mm. issues or whatever it mm. might be, mm. how do you build away from that and start to say you started dating someone and you really like them 
and you start to see these little things creep in like when they don't respond you're kind of feeling anxious mm. about mm. when you, you know whether they like you or not or any of these things and you start to feel your happiness become more and more yes codependent or dependent on them yeah so so that is down to self-esteem mm. and self-confidence and that is when really recognizing it first of all that's the most important thing you can do you've identified it you've identified that this perhaps an issue well done okay well done it's pause okay pause and then walk that step back recognizing where those thoughts come from recognizing that that is your past being dragged into your future and your present it's also important to let your partner know mm -hmm. um in a in the way where you're not lab loading them with all this emotional burden mm -hmm. um but letting them know that i've got you know i I, you know, you haven't responded to me on this text message or something, or you said one thing and you haven't done another. Um, it's really tapped into my insecurity. And I just wonder if you can help me with that. And if there's anything that we can, um, mm. you know, can you help, can you help me with me? But I'm also going to work on this myself. So again, yeah. it's just working on that self-esteem, remembering what you're great at, what you're good at, what brings you confidence. Surround yourself with those people as well outside of that relationship that gas you up, that lift you up, that inspire you. Don't, um, you know, surround yourself with mood hoovers, people that, you know, suck it out of you, make you feel crap about yourself. Ditch them. Just have those people around you that make you feel good. So particularly when you've come from a traumatic past, but also letting your partner know where your, and I say the word weaknesses, and I, that's not to be used in a negative mm. way, but your challenges yeah. are, that's probably a better word to use, where your challenges are around that and where it comes from, where those um where where it's been and what you want to work through but they are they can be a huge part in helping you to move through that situation so often it's acceptance um and it's then actively trying to move move through that i mean i've been in a you know emotionally controlling relationship i am very tuned into and on high alert uh to what i would deem controlling language um, it's a red flag. It's something that triggers me. Um, so, and in the past, you know, I have uh, accused my husband of coming out with, with words or phrases that I have felt were controlling, um, which perhaps in actual fact weren't, and he mm. certainly refuted it. Um, so it's having that conversation of, uh, well, it felt it to me, mm. um, him recognizing that it, that's what it felt to me, even though that intention wasn't. So then he could have gone, well, do you know what? Sod you, because it wasn't, and I'm not going to do anything about it. That's your yeah. issue. That ain't going to work in a relationship, <laughs> going, that's your issue, um, even if it might be. But him going, okay, well, look, I will try and rephrase that kind of language so it, it doesn't feel as perhaps direct direct as it, as it came across. So that's it. It's kind of doing that dance. But, e but equally, then him not losing sight or feeling like, he has to completely change who he is oh, to enable yeah, me yeah. because then that's just enabling. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say on that. And how about in that type of situation where that one person, because it sounds like that person who knows they're a bit more codependent and is kind of has this self-awareness around mm. these things has probably concentrated on where their um, challenges, as you said, are in relationships and dating and mm. it's really working on that. How do you think we can deal with relationships where one person's probably quite self-aware or aware of those issues that are kind of their downfalls and everything mm, mm. and someone else that isn't necessarily like that mm. and doesn't necessarily have a kind of awareness of you know what make what challenges them or what makes them run away or any of these mm. kind of different things how can a relationship grow whilst one person's probably being more vulnerable and the other isn't? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think boundaries, mm -hmm. you know, are, are really what come into this. You know, boundaries are really important. So I think if you are the um, emotionally stronger part of that relationship, it's letting your partner know how much you're prepared to give and help, but also where your boundary on that is. Um, and I think that's, and, and it's very important for, for both sides because often, yes, we can cross those boundaries and we go into unhelpful territory and enabling territory. So it's recognizing um, what you're prepared to do and mm -hmm. not to do and what are your hard lines. You know, it's, uh, it's sort of must haves in relationships and would be nice to haves. Um, and I think that's, it's perfectly doable. Um, but being vulnerable, being that vulnerable person in that relationship and then the one who is supporting, uh, it's important that that relationship really works towards balance. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Really works towards balance. And before we close, mm. one final question. Yeah. What is one piece of advice you would give to everyone dating in their 20s? Oh, gosh. Know yourself better than anybody else. Remember, we, if you, if it sounds cheesy, but I think I started the pod with this. If you are the best you can be to yourself, and if you are happy with yourself, you are content with your own company, you are, you've done all the work, you are ready to welcome someone else into your life. Um, so really what, it's not to say, you know, when we, when, you don't have to be completely fixed, you know, when none of us are fixed to go into a relationship, but do as much as you can on yourself mm. so that when you are on the dating scene, when you are in relationships, always remember your self-worth and the fact that you don't need this relationship to function or be happy or survive, that you would like it. It is complementary to your life, not an absolute condition and need. I think that's a must. I think it's so important. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for joining me. This has been amazing. And thank I you. think so many people are going to get a lot out of this episode. <laughs> so thank you for your expertise. We'll use this in our daily life. Yeah, oh, Grace, it has been a total pleasure, honestly. Thank you very much. <laughs>